The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar. My name is Glenda Cleasy, Agronomy Specialist with Saskatchewan Pulse Growers. With me today is Andrea Lauder, Communications Manager with Saskatchewan Pulse Growers. Thank you, Andrea, for all your organizing of this webinar. And uh, welcome to everyone on the line to the third webinar in the 2018 Pulse webinar series. We have one additional webinar scheduled. Webinars can be found on the Saskatchewan Pulse Growers website under News and Events tab. The final webinar of the season will be on insect scouting in pulse crops. As a reminder, CCA and CCSC credits are available for today's webinar. To get those credits, you must be watching it live. For those who are attending the webinar today, Andrea will send out an email after the webinar requesting your CCA or CCSC number. At this time, please respond. If more than one person is watching from your computer, you will need someone to verify all of those in attendance and can include all of the relevant CCA or CCSC numbers. The webinars are recorded and posted to SPG website for future viewing for those who are unable to attend or if you do want to look back at the material that was covered. Recordings will be posted to the Saskatchewan Pulse Growers website under the communications tab. For today's webinar, all participants will be muted. We will be happy to take any questions that you may have. To ask a question, please type your question into the question box located in the GoToWebinar dashboard. You can send a question in at any time. If the question is relevant at the moment, we will do our best to fit it in as we can at that time. Where a question can wait, we will hold the question until the end of the presentation. Today, I'd like to welcome our two speakers joining us from Pulse Canada. Today, speaking to us, we have Mac Ross and Gord Kerbis. Mac is the Manager of Market Access and Trade Policy, and Gord is the Director of Market Access and Trade Policy at Pulse Canada. Together, Mac and Gord work on behalf of the growers of pulses and special crops to bring resolution to a wide range of market access issues that can arise across the 160 plus countries that import from Canada the world's largest exporter of pulse crops. They also help position the industry to get out in front of future trade problems before they occur. As part of his role, Mac manages Pulse Canada's involvement in the Cross Commodity Keep It Clean initiative. Prior to working at Pulse Canada, Mac completed a degree in agribusiness from the University of Manitoba and worked in the crop protection sector. Gord is former co-chair of the Government of Canada's Industry and Government MRL Task Force and leads a Canadian multi-commodity project on harmonized MRLs that has wide representation across field crops and horticulture crops in Canada. Gord has an MSc in Agricultural Economics and has spent 19 years in the Canadian grain industry in the areas of market access, market analysis, trade policy, marketing and quality assurance. He has been with Pulse Canada since 2007. Mac and Gord are going to speak to us today on crop protection products on your farm and the importance of MRLs. So I will now turn the presentation over to Mac and Gord. Thanks, Glenda. As Glenda mentioned, it's uh, Mac Ross here with Pulse Canada. So first off, good afternoon, everyone. Um, thank you to Saskatchewan Pulse Growers for hosting this webinar and, and thank all of you for attending. Um, I know many of you are likely just coming off a winter full of of webinars and would much rather be out in the field than, than attending another one. So thanks for, for making some time. Um, as Glenda mentioned, Gord and I uh, are going to chat a little bit about the, the ripple effect from the use of crop protection products on your farm, or if you're an agronomist on your grower's farm, and the importance of, of MRLs to, to the success of our agricultural industry. <clears throat> so first, I'm just gonna set the stage a little bit and, and try and try and uh, expand on why you're, you're hearing from Canada and Pulse Canada on this particular subject. So we're unique in the sense that we're, we're very heavily reliant on our export market for the success of our industry. And as, as the graph on your, your, or the chart on your screen will, will show here is that Canada accounts for only 8% of global pulse production, India still being the, the highest pulse producing country in the world. Um, but when we move to the next slide, you'll see that although we uh, account for only 8% of global pulse production, we, we account for over a third of global pulse export. And, and we're unique in this sense, even compared to our neighbors to the south, uh, the US, 
Although the U.S. exports large quantities of egg commodities to, to China and other countries, they have a large domestic market as well to, to eat up some of that demand. And although that domestic market is growing in Canada, we still export over 80% of our crops. So the, the bottom line is we're, we're very heavily dependent on, on the export market as, as growers and as an industry here in Canada. Um, so keeping in mind our, our dependence on export and trade, today we're, we're going to discuss a potential barrier to, to that trade arising from, from MRLs or maximum residue limits. So as part of our discussion today, we're going to define an MRL or a maximum residue limit and discuss what an MRL is used for. We're also going to discuss the risks to our export market that are related to MRLs, as well as the steps that our industry is, is taking to, to try and prevent this risk. Um, and we're also going to look at the, the implications from MRL non-compliances and how does this affect you or, or your grower's farm business. And, and Last off, what, what can you do as either a, a grower of internationally traded crops or as an agronomic advisor uh, to protect the in, integrity of Canadian crops as well as maintain our reputation as a, as a world-class um, agricultural exporter? So first off, um, we'll start out with, with maximum residue limits. So what is an MRL? Uh, an M MRL, or a maximum residue limit, is the highest level of pesticide residue that could be found on a food product when a pesticide or crop protection product uh, is used according to label directions. So in Canada, MRLs are set by Health Canada, and they're neither a safety limit or a, a benchmark for, for human health. Um, they're primarily uh, used for trade purposes and are, are, are just a measure to ensure that crop protection products have, uh, have been used properly. Um, so to, to start things off with our broader discussion today, I'm going to turn it over to my uh, colleague and Pulse Canada's Director of Market Access, Gord Kerbis, and Gord's going to go into further detail on how MRLs are set internationally and, and the current shift that we're seeing in our trading environment that, that's sort of um, allowing or, or giving a platform for MRLs to, to pose a risk to us. So, Gord? Okay, thanks, Max. Uh, so what I'm going to go through here for the next uh, 10 minutes or so is really answering the question, why are we talking about MRLs like this in the spring of 2018 when we weren't, let's say, four years ago? Uh, and I'm going to start off with, uh, does an MRL mean food safety? Um, okay, so... Let's go through a few numbers and studies, and I'll show you where this fits on the on the chart uh, that you see on your right. We've got a few different thresholds there, starting from the top, the no observed adverse effect level, uh, below that the acceptable daily intake, and below that the maximum residue limit. And then I'm, I'm going to show you where the trade problems all happen, or the large majority of them, in, in a minute or two, and that's even below the maximum residue limit. But for now, uh, MRLs are pretty well studied. Jurisdictions like Canada, the US, Japan, Europe, and others uh, regularly to monitor these things. And the two most recent US uh, Food and Drug Administration and Canadian Food Inspection Agency results uh, reported on testing that they did on some pretty big sample sizes, just under 6,000 in the US, just over 3,000 in Canada. So what they were looking at is to see how many of those samples were above or below the MRL line. Uh, and what they found is that over 98% uh, in both cases, in particular in the US domestic production, uh, were below the MRL. So now let's go to the top uh, NOAL and ADI, or acceptable da daily intakes, and uh, talk a bit about that. So if there was 98% uh, that were compliant with the MRL, that means the balance uh, would have been above the MRL, and what do we know about that? Uh, for example, jurisdictions like the US conduct a total diet study where they have people that go into retail outlets uh, and they would buy, you can see here, it's uh, on average 280 different food products that are bought, they prepare them and they analyze them for 800 contaminants. This is done four times a year. And when they did that, they found that of the most frequently detected uh, residues, um, the most frequently detected one uh, was still one two hundredth of the acceptable daily intake. So when we go from the no observed adverse effect level, the NOAL, above which you would have a food safety problem, 
reduce that by the factor of 100 or sometimes 1,000 that regulators use to get down to the acceptable daily intake, then we go down to another two orders of magnitude or more than 100 times below that to get to the actual detection level of the most frequently detected pesticide in that uh, FDA total diet study. So I just wanted to drive the point home here that uh, could MRLs be a, a safety issue? Certainly. Uh, are MRLs in practice a food safety issue? Uh, we're, we're light years away from that. So just to set the stage, uh, and now I want to talk about the trade problem. It turns out that there's a lot of jurisdictions, and in fact a cr an increasing number around the world, uh, that put in zero or near zero defaults for MRLs that they don't have on their national lists. And I'll get into more of this in a bit. Uh, and, and as I mentioned, probably, uh, well, more than three quarters and probably close to 80% of the global MRL non-compliances uh, that the global agri-food international trade experiences are not due to even exceeding the MRL, which is already a low threshold, but exceeding that zero or near zero tolerance. So why are we talking about this in 2018 and not 2014? Um, there are three, three trends around the world, uh, any individual one of which I don't think that would push us into any kind of territory where we would be uh, taking as proactive a set of actions as we are as an industry to make sure that we, continue, we can continue to comply with whatever uh, tolerance or threshold is, is put out there. So the first one is that we see more and more missing MRLs, uh, and that comes with the application of zero or near zero default MRLs, uh, because there are more and more countries around the world that are moving away from the global standard of MRLs, uh, which is codex, toward their own custom in-country national MRL lists. The more we see of those, uh, the more potential there is for misaligned lists, uh, it's quite significant actually, and more potential for those zero or near zero defaults. The second thing is residue testing is more sensitive. Um, it's now possible, uh, the shorthand might be to say that you can now find anything in anything. That's not too far off. Uh, I'm gonna chart here in a moment. Uh, and now we're seeing heightened monitoring and testing. Uh, there are more and more countries around the world who are moving towards their own food safety modernization programs. Um, and although we may not see it yet, it seems reasonable to expect that a component of those sorts of modernization efforts will be heightened monitoring and testing. So, uh, and, and this is all driving back to the key point, meeting MRLs is not the problem. It's meeting the near zero default tolerances that could apply when an MRL has not been established in the importing country. So residue testing is more sensitive. Um, standard lab equipment uh, can now identify over 260 different residues per crop at well below one part per billion, depending on the matrix, uh, with a good level of selectivity. Now, uh, just to put, it, put that in context, uh, chemistry students have all sorts of examples of what one part per billion is and so on. One part per billion is one sheet of, of in a roll of toilet paper that stretches from New York to London. 100 parts per trillion is uh, one second in 320 years. That just about takes us back to the year when the steam engine was invented. So these are truly minute levels. Uh, second, we're now seeing more missing MRLs, more of these so-called national lists. So this is when a country says, no, I don't want to use codex anymore. I'm going to, I'm going to move towards my own custom list. The yellow on this pie chart is the safe part. Uh, this is the just under 25% of the 91 countries in this particular uh, analysis that still use codex only. Um, one notch up from there in terms of uh, trade facilitation is the green slice of this pie chart, which is where a country has a national list in place, but they say, okay, if we don't have an MRL on our list, we'll use the codex one anyways. That's not bad. Uh, the other uh, pies are the danger zone where it's, look, if we have an MRL on our list, uh, you're okay, but if you're not, then it's a zero or near zero, or we may have an undefined default policy where we provide no policy guidance on what we would do if we saw a residue. So which countries does this affect? 
Um, you know, I just wanted to throw up this chart uh, as an illustration that, uh, if anything, the greatest impact that misaligned and missing MRLs uh, are having is on developing countries. Um, we've been in a number of international forums where we've heard, uh, you know, some pretty impassioned pleas from people who represent growers in Kenya, for example, or in Uganda, who are saying, look, we've got major, major pest pressures, uh, and we need to deal with them somehow, uh, but we're facing all these zero thresholds or, or near zero tolerances because our uh, export destination, the importing country, has their own national list and they've got a ton of missing MRLs and we can't comply with these zeros. We can comply with any set MRL but not the zeros. So this is a pie chart uh, that, uh, that we've compiled in partnership uh, with others and it simply compiles uh, the, the information on global MRL non-compliances that are already publicly available from the seven countries around the world uh, that report on these publicly, which is the United States, Taiwan, Europe, Canada, Japan, Australia, and Hong Kong. Uh, and this is just to indicate that in the last full calendar year for each of those jurisdictions for which data was publicly available, and it's not all the same calendar year, so it's, uh, it's not the most straightforward uh, or easy thing to compile, it was just under 3,000. Now, what proportion of those MRL non-compliances were due to, hey, I actually exceeded the MRL uh, that was in place, even though you may well be or likely to be so far below the ADI that it's not a food safety concern, but how, what proportion of those MRLs were non-compliances because they, were, they had to comply but couldn't with a zero or near zero uh, MRL default? It turns out that that is uh, uh, somewhere between 15 and 20 percent that exceeded the actual MRL and the balance, 87 percent in this chart, which is provisional by the way, were due to the zero or near zero MRL problem. And this is provisional because uh, there is some uh, challenge in determining in some jurisdictions like Europe when you see a 0 0.01 ppm uh, MRL in place, is that because it's a default because there's a missing MRL or was it because the MRL uh, was set at that level on the basis of an assessment. And this uh, chart shows the MRL compliances by country of origin. The previous ones showed uh, MRL non compliances in the country that was importing the product. These are the countries that were exporting. Um, and you can, you can see uh, pretty clearly that it's well distributed, some countries more than others. So how do we manage the risk of non-compliance? And I'm gonna pass it back to Mac here uh, right away to talk about uh, keep it clean, which is a really, really important cornerstone. Uh, I mean, one of Canada's comparative trade advantages, arguably, is that we can comply with all these difficult and often competing and maybe misaligned international standards. And keeping it clean is a way to help us continue to do that. So that's the short term. The, and, and as Mac will note, it's not really a good medium or long-term strategy to not be able to use important technologies to grow crops. So medium term, we're, we want to work to attain the required MRL in, in the jurisdiction, if that's going to be possible. There's some jurisdictions that don't have uh, regulatory guidance for applying for an MRL when they don't have a domestic registration of that particular crop protection product. So that's called an import tolerance. But longer term, what we really need is for governments uh, to do a better job of talking to each other. Uh, so when they're doing their job to try to regulate crop protection products and protect consumer safety, et cetera, they're doing, a way, they're doing it in a way that's reasonably aligned with one another. Uh, and so far, there's a lot, of, a lot of evidence to suggest that that's not happening, even though there are some very, very bright spots and good examples of collaboration. Uh, like the global joint reviews uh, that Canada's Pest Management Regulatory uh, Agency participates in, and others. So I wanted to uh, describe uh, very briefly one international MRL, MRL coalition uh, and just give a, a 
a snapshot of just how extensive that membership is. Just to, just to illustrate that this is not an issue that affects Canada. We are trying to come up with a proactive way to make sure that we can continue to comply and have a great track record on compliances. But as you can see, there's a number of uh, organizations and jurisdictions around the world uh, that also feel the same way. And here's just a couple of examples of the work being done by that coalition where they're coming up with uh, case studies in order to be able to demonstrate uh, the effect of missing and misaligned MRLs on growers around the world, including uh, quinoa in Peru, uh, succulent peas and beans in Kenya, cranberries grown in the U.S., and a few others. Uh, Mac, now I'm going to pass the baton back to you. Thanks, Gord. So, so Gord talked about some of the longer-term uh, international coalitions and longer-term approaches to, to dealing with with this uh, this issue. Um, but what about what about the here and now and um, what, what we really want to do through, through initiatives like the Keep a Key, Clean collaboration or our annually issued grower advisories is to ensure that crop protection technologies that we or you as a grower currently have um, do not present an unacceptable risk. And, and I say unacceptable because we want to balance and not eliminate that risk uh, outright. I, I think we all agree that not using the, the newest uh, crop protection technology is, is not an option or, or is it a long-term solution. So, so we want to balance the trade risks arising from the factors that, that Gord discussed um, with the importance of, of these crop protection technologies to growers like yourself or if you're an agronomist to, to the growers that you advise on a, on a daily basis. So this slide just sort of, sort of uh, emphasizes um, the, the importance of, of these technologies to, to our industry and to our growers. Um, as you can see, uh, estimates from Crop Life Canada shows that uh, in investments in crop protection products and, and biotech are, um, can result in an estimated increased yield of 42% more, more grain as a whole, so wheat, corn, canola, barley, et cetera, um, improved environmental sustainability. Um, 35 million more acres would need to be in production here in Canada if, if we did not have access and were able to, to freely use these products. And also the overall cost of production lowers the cost of production, benefiting growers and our consumers. So saving, savings on food that require uh, wheat flour or soy may be as high as uh, 69% according to, to Crop Life Canada. So that just sort of emphasizes the, the importance of, of these tools that we currently have in our toolbox as growers. <clears throat> so... As, as Gord touched on some of the longer-term proactive measures that our industry is taking, um, what about the here and now and, and what can you do? And that, that brings us to the short-term measures that uh, we as a pulse industry and as a broader uh, agricultural industry um, are, are uh, exploring. So that, that brings us to our annual grower MRL advisories and the, and the Keep It Clean initiative. So I'll first start out with um, our annual MRL advisories. Uh, I hope some of you on the call do have some familiarity with, with these advisories and have seen them in the past. Um, what, what the annual MRL grower advisory is, is, is it's meant to advise Canadian pulse growers on application tips to, to help mitigate uh, the trade risks that, that Gord outlined, as well as to advise on the various products of concern in any given crop year. So how it's set up in this, uh, as you can see, is available at keepingitclean.ca because it is a live document. We, we generally don't print out and disseminate uh, copies. It's, it's online and easily accessible. Um, and, and how it's set up is, is you have sort of the five pulse crops with corresponding products that are designated either a green, yellow, or, or red light classification. So green would, would equal no marketing issue. Uh, yellow would indicate know your market and that there's at least one key export market where MRLs are missing or not established. So we ask that you consult with your, your grain buyer, your exporter, your processor uh, prior to uh, utilizing or planning to utilize that uh, product. And red would indicate not registered. So I'll get into some of the specific products for 2018 in a second. Um, first off, we'll just, we'll just touch on how we as a pulse industry group derive these MRL advisories. And um, it all comes back to, to sort of that balance that I touched on and, and will continue to, to touch on between uh, the, the evaluating the risk that these products could uh, cause and balancing that with how important these products are to our growers. So the Canadian pulse industry has been issuing 
these advisories since uh, about 2012. And a couple years ago, uh, 2015, 16, Pulse Canada worked with its members and uh, other industry stakeholders like Saskatchewan Pulse Growers to develop a formalized process and, and working group to produce uh, the, the yearly advisory. And, and this uh, process focuses on the need to balance trade risk with how agronomically important a product is, like I uh, noted, and address any trade risk while avoid, avoiding any creation of uh, disincentives for innovation. So in other words, we don't want MRL misalignment uh, in the global marketplace to hinder your ability as a grower uh, to use the latest crop protection products available here in Canada. So in 2016, um, the, the Pulse Value Chain Working Group uh, was established to make this advisory. And the working group consists of provincial agronomists, uh, Pulse growers, market access representatives, uh, members of, of the Pulse trade here in Canada, as well as Pulse Canada board members and staff, uh, so Gord and myself. And, and the working group provides a trade and agronomy perspective to help, help uh, create this advisory. And we, so we use a specific criteria to ensure that we're balancing this risk. And, and, and that criteria is, is what we look at is we include any product that has greater than a 5% uh, use pattern in any given year. And we'll include uh, in-crop and pre-harvest applied products only. Um, and we'll generally exclude, exclude seed treatments unless uh, there's special circumstances there. Um, and we'll focus on missing MRLs, not as much M misaligned MRLs. By focusing on um, missing MRLs, we're identifying the, the greater risk and, and trying to not make this uh, as convoluted as it, as it could be if we tried to capture everything. Um, we'll also look at any new products, so new products that are brought to the marketplace. We uh, will work with product registrants to establish if there, there may be uh, MRL concerns globally. And we also look at, uh, at, at major markets as well. So we look at the policy leaders and standard setters globally. So that, that generally includes Codex, the US, the EU, or Japan. And we'll look at other major key markets for, for pulse crops as well. And uh, again, it's all about uh, achieving that balance. and and eventually coming up with an advisory for, for yourself. So this is just a quick snapshot of our 2018 advisory, what it looks like. And again, this is available on keepingitclean.ca. I know SAS Pulse growers will be printing off some hard copies of this to, uh, to circulate to, to growers. Um, so you can sort of see the, the list of, I believe we have about eight different products, uh, crop protection products this year that, that uh, could could uh, cause concern for, for certain pulse crops. So um, as you can see, it's sort of a, a lot to take in and I'm, I'm not gonna delve into it, but um, we will encourage all of you, uh, whether you're an agronomic advisor or a grower to, to take a look at this um, prior, to, prior to applying products uh, this year. And alongside with this advisory, um, we, We'll talk about some of the broader messaging on, on what you can do as a grower, or what you can advise your growers um, to do uh, to, to help aid in this, this uh, goal to mitigate MRL-related risk. And, and we put out these advisories as well as these broader tips that I'll get into under the, the Keep It Clean collaboration. So what is Keep It Clean? Um, hopefully you guys have, have, have seen this before, seen this logo or this, uh, this trademark. Um, what, what the Keep It Clean is, is a, a collaboration between the Canola Council of Canada, uh, Cereals Canada and ourselves, Pulse Canada. And this, this initiative was started by the Canola Council um, and joined by us, recognizing that maintaining open markets for all commodities is, is real critical to Canada's ag sector. So, our three associations work together through Keep It Clean to try and provide growers with the info they need to ensure that their crops are, are market ready. So Keep It Clean aims to provide accurate and, and, and hopefully timely and relevant info in order to protect Canada's reputation around the world as a, as a trusted supplier. So um, a little bit about our reach and, and sort of the scope of our messaging. Uh, we, we try and uh, get, get our messaging, so tips specific to canola cereals and pulses, as well as uh, broader, broader tips for growers out uh, through, a, I guess, a myriad of uh, different, different communication efforts. We, we send out uh, postcards. We've, we've got a social media presence that will hopefully be ramped up here 
this growing season. So hopefully you'll see a lot more of the of the keep it clean. Um, there there's presence at trade shows, et cetera, and um, and again this is this is sort of just an example of of what you'll see coming from the keep it clean collaboration. This is an example of a postcard that was sent out to growers this year. So the slogan was keep your crop in shape to ship out. And on the back side of this postcard were, were recommendations for certain products uh, in, in canola, cereals, and, and pulses. So products that could be of concern for, for the global marketplace. And again, all, all this info is, is available on keepingitclean.ca. I'm going to try and pump the tires of that uh, website as we continue to go on here. So hopefully it's uh, something that you guys will check out after this. Um, so when we look at key messages under the Keep It Clean, clean collaboration, we, we have key messaging that's specific to pulses. So, um, and, and some of that messaging is just using caution when we're, we're using uh, late season applied uh, products such as fungicides, insecticides, or uh, pre-harvest aids. And just the understanding and cognizant, cognizance that this, uh, this type of use of product may result in unacceptable residues. And, and also another, another main point through the Keep It Clean that's pulse specific is, is the pre-harvest use of glyphosate. So obviously that's of, of um, interest for, for a couple reasons. Uh, the increased public and political scrutiny around that active ingredient, I'm sure you're, you're all well aware of. Um, and, and again, certain products like glyphosate have, have label requirements to, to apply at a certain staging. So for glyphosate, for example, at a pre-harvest uh, application, you, you want to ensure that you're applying below 30% moisture. When you do apply above 30% moisture, there, there's a chance of, of increased residues. As for the key messages that, that we push uh, under the, the broader Keep It Clean collaboration, so not exactly pulse specific, um, but we have four key messages for, for growers and agronomic advisors. The, the first one being do not exceed the, the product's labeled rate. Um, so, like I said off the start, an MRL is, is set with, with the idea that it's a, a measure of, of a pesticide when it's been used properly, and, and used properly obviously means, uh, means following the rate during application. The second, um, second key message is, is uh, time the application according to label. So we talked about uh, various uh, moisture determinations when applying products like glyphosate or other pre-harvest aids like safafenasol or heat. You want to ensure that uh, you're you're trying the best you can to to hit the majority of the crop at the stage that that's indicated on on the label. And the third tip is uh, consult with your exporter and processor about which crop protection products are acceptable in the international markets. And and we uh, I, I touched on that before. Our advisory is is a guideline for growers. But at the end of the day, your your buyer or your exporter who's who's selling this your crop to the, to an end end user is going to be the they're going to have the best sense of of which markets may be sensitive. So that's uh, always sort of the the last thing you want to double check is is that you're talking with with your buyer as well. And last but not least, uh, check out the advisory as well as as other uh, Keep It Clean communication on our site. So the keepingitclean.ca has all this information. Like I said, our advisory is is a living document. There can be changes uh, regulatory or uh, registration-wise for certain products throughout the year. So we want uh, you to ensure that you're getting the, the, the most current information, which is, which is always going to be found on our, on our site. So, so again, um, we're, we're about to, to wrap things up here. And, and um, I, I know when we, we go through these, these basic messagings, like staying to rate, staying within staging, um, they, they can seem very basic, and, and we know that the growers, as well as the agronomists on the phone, practice these measures already, and, and we totally understand the pressures that the growers face during the growing or application season. So, for example, we, you know, you're spending a significant cost on a product that, that may only achieve optimum efficacy if it's applied within a short window, compounded by the fact that you, you have other, other fields that are at the same stage or progressing quickly, um, plus it might be about to rain and the rain fast on that product is, is only an hour or, or what have you. There's, there's sort of a myriad of factors that growers have to deal with at application timing. So it's very much understood how it can sound when we're preaching stay within the rate and staging. But I, I think the real goal 
of the Keep It Clean initiative is to just try and connect the dots and ensure that the entire value chain, so growers, agronomists, grain buyers, and exporters are, are engaged in knowing the risks that various on-farm management practices can have to our export market. Um, so today we hope by providing some of the added context around these trade risks that it's something that's going to be in the back of your mind uh, this year when you're when you're applying these products uh, during the growing season. So to, to wrap up for for the sort of the bullet points uh, before we open it up for for questions that you may have uh, what, what, what we sort of hope you take away from our conversation today is is first off we, we talked about how not only pulses but all the commodities we grow here in Canada are, are heavily reliant on the export market the so pulses we we export to over 130 countries around the world um, and as Gord mentioned all of those can have their own regulations as it pertains to MRLs um, and when we talk about MRLs that we're not talking about a food safety issue it, it's it's something that's going to be similar to GM crops. You're going to continue to hear more and more about MRLs. And uh, we also hope that you took away on some of the ongoing efforts that, that we're taking as an industry as a proactive approach to get in front of this, this problem. So uh, Gord touched on the international coalition work uh, long term. And, and in the short term, how we're, we're looking at you guys, we're, we're putting out the annual advisories uh, that's created by our working group to help ensure that, that you feel, and we hope you do feel, you have the right information to, to make, uh, make the decisions that, that are going to ensure our exports are, are accepted by, by our trading market, markets. And uh, again, that, that messaging includes paying attention to product labels, um, especially with those politically sensitive active ingredients. Um, so in, unless Gord has anything to add, I, I think that pretty well wraps up our discussion today, Gord. No, that sounds good, Mac. I think uh, I think we're ready for questions. Thanks very much, both of you. Uh, we really appreciate your time today. So now, at this time, feel free to type in questions as you may have them. We've got a few that have come in here for you guys, so we'll just get started. And again, as a reminder, if anything comes to your mind, just type it in the text box on the dashboard of your GoToWebinar, and we will get those questions answered for you. So one of the questions that came in was uh, going back a little bit, Gord, to when you were talking about uh, the different countries and MRLs, is is there a spot where a person could get a hold of which countries follow Kodax versus those that have their own MRL list or have a national list? Uh, well, that's a good question. Uh, in general, you've got you've got to do a lot of work in order to find out uh, those specifics. Uh, just as an example, on that on the uh, sheet that Mac showed there from the Keeping It Clean, there was uh, eight active ingredients multiplied by five pulse crops, and embedded in there um, are anywhere between four or half a dozen, or, or sometimes even more. Uh, markets that we're looking at to see whether we've got the MRLs in place, uh, who follows Codex, and whether there is a missing national MRL, and there may even be a missing Codex MRL. So if I'm doing the math on that, that's five crops by eight actives by, you know, maybe six or more, and that's 240 individual MRLs. So what our working group tries to do is look at specifically which of those MRLs are concerns, and then uh, translate it down into either that like green or yellow or red. So I guess individuals could go further and, and seek out the, the specific MRLs in different jurisdictions if they want to, but our intent with that is to try to do that homework for people. Yeah, and I'd maybe just add to that as well, Gord, that um, if, if it is a grower or an agronomist uh, asking that question, it, at the end of the day is we really encourage encourage growers to to talk to their exporter or their grain buyer that they're going to know, as, as we emphasized earlier, they're going to know and have the best sense of, of the markets that they're selling into. So we, we have this advisory that tries to compound some of this information and, and aggregate it. But at the end of the day, your, your grain buyer is going to know uh, the sensitivities that, that are out there. Yes. And having said that, uh, you can Google uh, Codex MRLs and on the Food and Agriculture Organization website, uh, you can query uh, any codex MRL. Same, same goes for uh, 
uh, Europe and other jurisdictions, and some other jurisdictions. Okay, that sounds great. Thank you. Um, you've talked a lot about the Keeping It Clean initiative. How long has Pulse Canada been involved in keeping it clean? Uh, you know what? This is this is uh, 2018 is the third time we've been putting up our advisory uh, on keeping it clean, and it's a really great platform. So it's a one-stop shop, and hopefully more and more people just have keeping it clean in the front of their minds. So they don't have to remember or they don't have to go to three different websites, Serials, Canola, and Pulse. Um, Pulse Canada has been putting out some form of this uh, advisory uh, since 2011. Uh, and in that year, we started off with one active ingredient in one jurisdiction, and it was pretty simple. And now uh, that's grown to the, as I say, the uh, 200 uh, or up to 240 plus MRLs that uh, we contend with today for the 2018 advisory. Okay, thank you. Uh, what, just to, I guess, maybe put it in context, what is one of the biggest risk or risks um, that would help producers understand the importance of MRLs? Like we talked about the importance to the export market, but what really is the biggest risk to the export market? You know what, it's really a zero tolerance. That's, that's the real key in all of this. Uh, I mean, there's some gray areas where, um, you know, you could have an MRL that's in place in the importing country, but maybe it's not high enough, or it is high enough, but uh, there could be some variability around the levels. Um, but you know, if you were to say what was the one thing here, it is missing MRLs in importing countries that result in zero tolerances or near zero tolerances. Okay. Um, can growers get seed tested for residues if they think they might be concerned and how do buyers um, test for MRLs or what is the cost for all these tests? So there are uh, various labs in Western Canada that will, will test samples for a grower. Um, obviously the cost is, is sometimes a barrier to that. I, I believe depending on the test and, and what, what spectrum of active ingredients you're looking at, um, you, you could be running anywhere from two to 200 to uh, even $400 a sample. So um, that, that's, that's currently what's out there as an option for individual growers. And buyers and exporters would use, would use these labs too whenever they, uh, they, they are looking to monitor or do some testing on their own. There are, there are various uh, um, accredited labs that, that are approved and, and regulated to be able to do this work in Canada. Is there any risk to the producer themselves? Is there any way to tie any misuse of, of following the label back to the producer? So, so currently, um, you might have seen that there was a, there's an article in the Western Producer. I, I think it was a couple months ago talking about a, a certain uh, grain handling company that, that does have the ability to, to trace back to a, to a certain grower um, if they, they see a sort of an exceedance of a, uh, of, of residues from from the Canadian MRL, but but currently, really, um, I think that that's not something that that's a, that's a grave concern to the individual grower, and that that's why we're really trying to to show it, through the Keep It Clean program that we are all in this together, and we all have a responsibility to ensure that we're we're um, using these technologies properly, and and that our our reputation as a as a trusted supplier remains intact. So. Right now, it's, it's something that's incumbent upon all all stages of the value chain to be uh, be doing this ourselves. We don't really have a um, a real watchdog or or a consequence. Um, but obviously, uh, if a if a company has a declaration, um, they that that has uh, teeth as well. If you're a grower and you're you're signing off on a declaration stating that you uh, have not used used the product, there's obviously uh, consequences there. So. Hopefully that answers the question. I think it does. Um, unless anybody ha has any more questions popping in, that's the end of our questions right now. Um, if anything comes up, we'll throw it in. But at this time, I'd just like to send a big thank you to Mac and Gord for speaking to us today on crop protection products and MRLs. And as well, a thank you to Andrea for organizing the session today. And a big thank you to all of the participants on the line for joining us for the webinar today. 
As a quick reminder, CCA emails will be sent out, so please reply with your CCA or CCSC number in order to get your credits. And as well, feel free to provide any suggestions for future webinar topics at the same time. Those feedback and suggestions are always appreciated. As well, please mark your calendars for our next and final webinar for this season, which will take place at noon on June 6th, covering insect scouting in pulse crops. And our speaker will be Jim Tanzi, who's uh, the entomologist with the Saskatchewan Ministry of Agriculture. Again, you can sign up for this webinar from the Saskatchewan Pulse Corps website under News and Events. So thank you for your Thanks time. Thanks for everyone. having us as part of your webinar series, Glenda. Thank you so much, you guys. Have a great day. You do. Thanks.